I had wanted to start this video with some gratuitous footage of cats, but my cats are getting elderly and they're not as energetic as they used to be. I wanted to do this not just to up my viewership, but also to demonstrate the give and take of contrapuntal textures. When cats play fight, one will move forward, the other will faint backwards. One will crouch down, another will rear up. One will raise his paw and the other will roll underneath him in order to gain advantage. My point is that the physical movements of these animals has a kind of repertoire of different coordinated moves and that these moves are presented in an order that gives a kind of narrative to the feline play fight. The various textures and kinds of motion used in counterpoint serve a similar function. Ernst Talk described this phenomenon when he described the true nature of counterpoint as opposition, contradiction, fighting. The two opposed musical lines reveal the chief weapons of this fight, the two chief means of contrapuntal expression, contrast in rhythm and contrast in the direction of motion. He also described a similar phenomenon in the real world two children play at catch or hide and seek, the pursued every once in a while teasing the pursuer into a demonstrative challenge. Butterflies are engaged in a flirtation, chasing each other, yet once in a while flying together for a stretch in a coquettish mock truce, until one breaks loose again and provokes the other into resuming the chase. In his book, Gratisad Parnassum, J.J. Fuchs presented three types of motion. He explained that direct motion occurred when two or more voices moved in the same direction, contrary motion occurred when they moved in different directions, and oblique motion occurred when one voice remained static. Many counterpoint teachers tend to favor the use of contrary motion and discourage the use of the other two types. This is because counterpoint implies polyphony and polyphony implies multiple independent voices. Contrary motion encourages the independence of voices. This is impossible with the other two types of motion. While I was explaining the superiority of contrary motion to my counterpoint class one day, it dawned on me that I didn't actually believe what I was saying. In my own music, I use direct motion and oblique motion ever but as much as contrary motion. Each one produces its own kind of effect, and I use these effects to help me structure my music. For example, if I were to compose a two-voice version of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, I would start the voices in unison and then have them split into parallel thirds. After that, they would move into sixths with different rhythms before coming to rest of the cadence through contrary motion. These changes of texture create a contrapuntal structure that starts from a single point splits off into two voices that are locked together before finally becoming independent. It moves from the least complex to the most complex, the least motion to the most motion. Master composers did the same kind of thing. For example, Mozart began on a Kleine Nachtmusik in parallel octaves before he split the instruments off into polyphony. Bach's D major fugue from the Well-Tempered Clavier Book 1 changes textures often. Examples range from direct motion in parallel thirds and sixths to complete planing chords. Even when the piece contains contrary motion, the bass line at the end, the texture is often homophonic, first species counterpoint. While technically this is a four-part fugue, there are rarely more than two truly independent parts playing at a time. One part is a pattern made from 16th and 32nd notes, and the other is accompanying chords. Bach's C minor fugue, from the same collection, has examples of direct motion when the bass line tracks in thirds. Later in the piece, direct motion is found in the interjections of parallel thirds. These thirds act like guideposts, demarcations that keep the scale and the baseline figure on track. Ernst Talk used the opening of Bach's F major two-part invention to illustrate how the composer used parallel intervals to pull strongly to a goal. The piece begins with a statement of a motive that consists of a rising eighth note arpeggio alternating with the tonic pedal. 
The second measure repeats the motive in the other voice, while the first voice plays a counter motive comprised of falling 16th note stepwise patterns. This structure is repeated, with the voices switched, in the third measure. The fourth measure has the motive again in the bass, with a new, rather static accompaniment pattern in the top part. In the next measure, and the one after that, this accompaniment pattern is repeated, moving down a third at the start of each measure. The pattern is tracked in parallel six on the bass part. These parallel intervals focus the listener's attention on the overall downward motion of the passage, until a variant of the motive, this time in C, appears in measure 7. I say this is in C because the G arpeggio outlines a dominant 7th chord in C. This is followed by a variant of the motive outlining a C chord, which becomes a dominant 7th, which leads temporarily back to F, before finally modulating solidly to C. Note that measure 9 consists of material based on the counter motive tracked in sixths with the bass. These parallel sixths lead to a cadence formula in the upper part that leads to a strong cadence, and another entry of the motive in the dominant key, C major. My point is that the parallel motion leads the ear to the statements of the motive, and provides a contrast with the contrary motion used against the motive. It should be noted that in addition to using different textures to structure the invention, Bach has also used going to and arrived at music. In my videos on melody, I showed how these two types of music, based on general types of musical motion, were used to help structure sonata forms. Bach's doing the same kind of thing here. The opening four measures are arrived at music. They are thematic, predictable, all in the same key, stable. Measure five begins a passage of going to music that ends in measure 11. It's music that's unstable, sequential, it changes keys. It's also dynamic, by which I mean that it pushes forward. Measure 12 starts an entry of the motive, another section of arrived at music. Much of Bach's music is structured by alternating sections of arrived at and going to music. However, where one begins and the other ends is not always clear. For example, measure 7 seems to contain a statement of the motive. I think this is probably still part of the going to music. While the parallel sixths in the previous measure lead strongly into it, I don't feel a strong cadence at this point. I think that this is due to the motion continuing in the bass. The motive itself's been altered, maybe not enough to make it lose its identity, but enough to make it unstable. Something resembling the motive comes in the bass in the next measure. This time it's also a variant, and it arpeggiates a different chord, but it is sequential with the measure before. Because it's sequential, it feels like it's moving, so it's going to music. Students are often frustrated by Bach's references to the motive during such passages of going to music. They feel that he should be more clear about what's thematic and what's going to music. I think that Bach is perfectly clear when he wants to be. Measure 12 is a clear stopping place, a clear cadence, and a clear beginning of the motive. Part of the point of labeling things as arrived at or going to music is that these designations are independent of themes or motives. They may be used to differentiate one section of music from another, even if both use the same melodic material. Not every 18th century composer used going to music to help define their musical structures. Here's the G major fugue from Carl Caspar Ferdinand Fischer's collection, Ariadne Musica. Its theme, the fugue subject, is one and a half measures long and it starts by itself in the tonic key. The second voice enters in the middle of measure two in the dominant. The imitation is real, by which I mean that Fisher hasn't cheated. He hasn't altered any of the pitches of the subject to fit the harmony. I say that this entry's in the dominant, but it's not really very strongly in the dominant. The C sharp leads to the D in the third measure, but it quickly switches back to the key of G after that. There's a tag at the end of the theme in the second voice, supplying it with a leading tone to set up a cadence in G to mark the entrance of the third voice in tonic. The fourth voice enters a measure and a half later on the dominant. 
The rest of the piece is comprised of statements of the subject, often overlapping. There's a brief code at the end, but there are no significant sections of going to music. In contrast to the Fisher example, the Bach fugue in C minor from the Well-Tempered Clavier Book 1 starts out with a two-measure statement of the fugue subject in the tonic key. The second voice is in the dominant. Unlike the Fisher example, this is really in the dominant key of G minor. Bach had to cheat to make this key change happen. He had to use tonal imitation. For example, he changed the interval between the third and fourth notes of the subject from a second to a third. Because Bach's second statement of the subject ends in G minor, it needs a longer tag at the end so that the piece can return to the tonic key. This tag consists of two measures of going to music based on the opening of the fugue subject. After that, the subject enters again, in the third voice, in the tonic key, in the bass. This is followed by an episode of two measures of going to music. This going to music is based on the opening of the subject in the right hand and the opening of the counter subject, a descending scale, in the left hand. Bach's use of fragments of the subject in his episodes, his sections of going to music, might seem ambiguous. I believe that the fugue subject has an identity as a complete theme. It has a specific length, two measures. It repeats the two sixteenths followed by three eighth notes pattern three times before it starts a cadence formula formed by two sixteenths, a quarter note, and two sixteenths. While the statements of the subject can alter this characteristic structure slightly, all characteristics must be present in some form for a true entry of the subject to occur. I believe that statements of the theme require that all of these elements be present. This happens in the next two measures where they enter the subjects in E-flat major. The two measures after that are an episode of going to music. After that, two more measures of subject, this time in the alto, in G minor. A three-measure episode of going to music follows that, with a statement of the subject in the tonic and the soprano after that. A four-and-a-half-measure episode of going to music follows that, with a statement of the subject starting in the middle of the measure in the bass. The final statement of the subject happens in the soprano, in the tonic key over a pedal point. 
we've talked about how different types of texture and different types of motion can structure a piece like a fugue. So, what actually is the structure of a fugue? This is a difficult question to answer because there are many different approaches to writing a fugue. In his fugue, Fisher states the fugue subject as many times as there are voices, bringing in each voice one at a time. This is the fugal exposition. Then he keeps stating the fugue subject again and again and again until he's had enough and he simply ends the piece. Apart from the beginning, the fugal exposition, the piece has very little structure. On the other hand, Bach structures his fugue using going to and arrived at music. He begins, like Fisher, with each voice entering separately with the statement of the subject. This is followed by arrived at sections that are entries of the subject in various keys and voices. Interspersed with these are sections of going to music that move from one statement of the subject to another and help facilitate the key changes. This gives the piece a kind of structure that's missing from the Fisher example. In addition to episodes of going to music, Bach also uses key changes to help structure the piece. After the exposition, he has an entry of the subject in E-flat major. There's another one after that in G minor, and then he returns back to C minor for three more statements of the subject. It could be argued that these key changes structure the piece. I can't really buy that. To me, the key changes do sound different in the middle entries, but without the going to music in between them, they don't sound different enough. They sound like the constant entries in the Fisher Fugue. Just more of the same stuff. There is the idea floating around that there's a kind of a recap to a fugue that defines the end of the form. One of the problems with a lot of Baroque music is that it's potentially open-ended. In the Fisher, for example, Fisher could have added more entries of the subject and kept the piece going for a very long time. Even though the Bach is more highly structured, Bach could have added more middle entries of the fugue subject and more episodes of going to music and kept the piece going forever. A key change could signal the end of the piece and close off the form. The idea of a fugal recapitulation is that tonic should return toward the end of the piece and that there should be a statement of the fugue subject and tonic at that point. In the Bach, the tonic returns about two-thirds of the way through, and there are three statements of the fugue subject after that. To me, that doesn't strongly signal closure. What does strongly signal closure is the pedal point under the last entry. This is a change in the predominant type of motion. It's no longer contrary, but oblique motion. While there is a chord progression above the pedal, the pedal point suggests that tonic is here to stay, which means that the piece is nearing its end. Bach also tacks on a one major cadence formula to the end of the previous statement of the subject in the bass. I hear that statement as being very strong, and that that cadence formula could actually have ended the piece. The last statement of the subject over the pedal point supplies the kind of redundancy typical of endings. Because the subject is repeated over a pedal, it doesn't have the opportunity of going anywhere else. It sounds as if the piece must end here. So aside from a fugal exposition, a fugue doesn't really have a standard function. Look at many different Baroque composers, and you'll see many different structures. But this was not true of later generations. After Bach, the idea that the fugue was structured with alternating sections of going to and arrived at music became a kind of standard. I think this is because Bach became so famous and because his music was so widely played that we came to believe that the music of Bach defined the Baroque. In many ways, this is absurd. Bach certainly was not typical of his time. I personally think that we dwell on the music of Bach to the exclusion of other Baroque composers because we see in his music models for our own. I know this was true in the classical period and in the romantic period, and I think it's still true today.